How many of y'all had enough of snow? Amen? Amen. Everybody's like, amen. Uh, Andy, come on. All right. Yeah, I'm with you on there. I do, I do like snow. I hate cold. Yeah. I don't like the wind, you know. I'm so tired of the wind. My sinuses and my ears are finally, you know, drained, and I can hear and smell and, you know, and ah. I, I'm telling you, spring needs to hurry up and get here. And I know we already celebrated the first day of spring, but I'm telling you what, I'm ready. I'm ready for just nice, warm weather continuously. Amen? All right, while this is pulling up, let's... uh. Let's do what we all know how to do, okay? Let's raise our swords. Let's go to battle. Let's prepare. Preparation. Father God, <laughs> you know, there's so many things that we could talk about in this world, Father God, but the one thing that we need to talk about is more of you. More of you and less of us. Father, we lift up your word today, Lord, because why? Because it's perfect. It's it's our defense against the enemy. It's our shield from his arrows, from his swords. Father God, we lift this up because we know that when we do this, Father God, that we are giving humbleness, humility to you, Father God. We are coming before you as your children, as your servants. And we are saying, Father God, that you hear us. You heal us. You help us, because that's what we desire. We desire that in our life today. We give all glory and praise to you, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So, who can tell me what we talked about last week? Can anybody tell me what we talked about last week? Y'all some real studious people, ain't you? The day after. The days after. Okay? There's 40 days that Jesus walked after his resurrection. And I'm really hot, Ryan. Maybe it's this. Get away. No, I'm just kidding. Jesus walked 40 days after his resurrection doing what? Was he... Window shopping, looking for land. Was he looking for a vineyard to buy? You know, was he trying to build a condo? You know, what was Jesus doing 40 days after his resurrection? Oh, my goodness gracious. He was encouraging and teaching his disciples. Now, he did it for three years, right? They followed him around for three years, learning listening, following his example, and hearing what Jesus was saying about what was coming and how to handle it. Even after his resurrection, he didn't take time off, right? He didn't take a break. He didn't go on vacation. Jesus went right back to work and started doing what Jesus does best, loving people, teaching people, making disciples, and then sending them out, right? I mean, it says it, right? Where's our loving, our purpose statement, loving, reaching, teaching, sending for Christ. We are to be exactly like Jesus, regardless the situation. I didn't have to be here today. My mom passed away yesterday. But you know what Jesus says about the dead? The dead will handle the dead, right? I've got to continue doing what Jesus has called me to do for the living. We've got to continue moving forward for what God's word is going to transpire in our lives. Amen? All right. Turn your Bibles to John 20, 19 through 23. We'll probably continue to read this verse the whole time, so just get used to it. Just mark your Bibles for the next three Sundays. 
John 20, 19 through 23. So what did he say? What were the four words that Jesus spoke that were the main theme of this scripture verse? Can anybody tell me? Bam! Peace be with you. So let's read this, okay? On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Come on, church. All right. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, y'all are getting it. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you, okay? He's putting charge. He's putting action to their motivation, all right? I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Mm. Powerful. It's amazing how we could take, you know, just so many lines of a verse and we can get power and purpose, which will be the next two topics we'll be talking about the next two Sundays. Okay, so mark that down. But Jesus says he doesn't say anything at that moment about power or purpose. He wants to establish peace first and foremost. Peace be with you. Okay. The order is really important. I want you to write this down, okay? On the back of your your bulletins, you have the the notes. Fill in the blanks. Write this down. The peace that Jesus gives is before and underneath any of our empowered actions or any of our purposeful deeds. We don't initiate peace with Jesus by our actions. There is nothing I can do that will initiate that peace with Jesus. How does it happen? How does that peace happen? Jesus initiates that peace with us. He's the one that is mighty enough, he is the one that is powerful enough, he is the one that is purpose-driven enough to have the peace of the Father that's in him that needs to be residing in me, in you, in us. Peace be with you. Mm. The Apostle Paul, he he wrote 13 of those 21 New Testament letters. And he explains it like this, okay? In Ephesians 2, 14 through 18, you can turn there if you desire to. Ephesians 2, 14 through 18, it says, He, Jesus, himself is our peace, who has made us both one, Jew and Gentile, and reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing The hostility. Did you get that? What does it say? What what does God's word say about marriage? Anybody? Come on, you married folk. Y'all better be chiming in real quick. (laughs) Okay, that's good. (laughs) Tiffany, you're right on. That's good. That's good. Okay, it says where, where, you know, two become one. All right. So if if we're paying attention to this, he is saying, I am gathering all of you with me. All right. When Jesus went to the cross and he went literally through the cross, I wish I had that illustration. I wanted to make this cross that when, you know, I stab it with a nail, it would just bleed, you know, and I might still do that. All right. But Jesus literally went through the cross. When they drove those nails through his hands and through his feet, the sinew, 
the skin, the blood, the sails, the tissue literally was driven through the wood of the cross. He literally went through it. And he did that. Why? To prove to you that he loves you and that you are forgiven and you are not guilty any longer. And he said, I'm gathering you. I reconciled us both to God in one body through the cross. He took everything that we have, the past, the present, and the future sins of humanity, he took with him and he went through the cross literally to prove to us that we are not guilty and that we are one together in one body, thereby killing hostility. Can anybody tell me what the hostility is? Sin, hatred, depression, anxiety, fear. We're going to be learning about these things, okay? Write this down. The peace that Jesus offers the disciples <clears throat> is peace that he accomplished when he died for them on the cross. So if you look at verse 20, that's why he says in verse 20. What did he say in verse 20? Let's go back up here and take a look. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 53, 5. 53, 5. says basically the same thing. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then he says, I am the one who died. I am the one who died. I am the one you abandoned. Mm. And I am the one who was pierced for your transgression. And the reason I can offer you peace is because by my blood, Jesus is saying, I have covered all your sins. Anybody ever butchered an animal? Huh? Yeah? I remember when uh, my dad used to take me hunting, and uh, it was tradition, and I don't know why hunters do this. This is the oddest tradition ever. But, you know, when your first hunt, you got to either eat a piece of the animal, you know, or something like that. It's gross. It's disgusting. I know. You know, but butchering an animal is messy. It's, it's messy. It is, it's disgusting, right? It's kind of disgusting. The blood, blood is not really clean, right? I mean, some blood carries a lot of bacteria, a lot of disease, a lot of infection, you know? And some people are like, how can I be cleansed by dirty blood? Well, hey, hey, Jesus' blood is definitely not dirty, right? I mean, if, if we had one ounce of Jesus' pure blood running in our veins, nothing would be able to touch us, nothing. But you already have it, don't you? You just don't realize it, do you? Right? Right? We all have God's blood running in us. God made us. And Jesus is his son, so, hey, put two and two together. Jesus says, if you trust me, your sins won't be held against you. The wrath of God is turned away. Hallelujah. That's what Paul meant when he said, Christ reconciled us both to God through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He took away God's anger and wrath that was meant for you and I. Isn't that nice to know? Wouldn't it be nice to know that if you were about to go see the judge, that somebody would stand up in the courtroom and say, you know what, I'm going to take the sentence for them. I know Reggie's guilty, 
He, you know, he's a liar, he's a thief, he's a manipulator, you know. He, he could possibly even be a verbal killer. That's my rap name, you know, verbal killer. Anyway, and, but I'm going to stand up here and, and, and I'm going to say, you know what? He's innocent and I'm guilty. He's innocent and I'm guilty. That's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. He was like, Father God, I want to proclaim my guilt for their innocence. I want you to say that I need to be held accountable for their sins. And I am willing to do whatever it takes, Father God, through punishment, through hell, through chaos, through whatever pain I need to suffer. So that way they'll know that they are free and that they are not guilty. Isn't it nice to know that we're not guilty? Yeah? We are innocent. And nobody can hold us guilty. It's not innocent until proven guilty anymore. It's innocent because I'm innocent. I am not guilty. If you want to say that I'm guilty, <laughs> you go talk to God. <laughs> See how that works out for you. Won't be pretty. All the hostility between God and us was absorbed on the cross. <laughs> I don't think we can comprehend the magnitude the, and the weight that Jesus bore for us that day. I can't imagine how heavy he was. You know, I think scholars said that Jesus probably weighed like, what, a buck 25, a buck 50, you know? But the sins of the world weighed upon him so much that the cross that they hung him on could barely withstand the weight. It creaked and it moaned under the weight. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. In my mental midgetry, I can't even comprehend a picture of that. It's overwhelming. To my senses. Jesus stepped out of the grave with joy. <laughs> with joy in his voice. He talked with his friends along the road, people who didn't even recognize him, <laughs> people that thought they had lost their friend, their savior forever. They thought they were never, ever, ever going to see him again. Boy, if they only knew who Jesus really was, right? I mean, you would think these people knew who Jesus really was. They spent three years with him, seeing him do things that were abnormal in humanity. Bringing people back to life, you know? It, you know, if I didn't think it would freak Dottie out, I'd go over there, spit, and rub it in her eye. Jesus did that. I know, yuck. He spit in the dirt and he rubbed it in people's eyes and they, the blind became where they could see. He would touch people's ears and the deaf could hear. He would walk by a lame person that probably didn't even have a leg or something like that and he would say, pick up your mat and go home. And it was like instantaneously they had a leg and they would get up and they would walk and go home. I can only imagine having the power and the purpose in my life to be able to do that. If you've never written, read the books by uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth, get it and read it. He experienced that kind, of, that kind of power and purpose that Jesus had in his life. He tells a story of one time where a legless man was sitting outside of a shoe store. And he so longed for a new pair of shoes. And Smith Wigglesworth came up and he saw him and he was depressed and he was downtrodden. And he was like, what is your issue, dude? I'm paraphrasing. He said, what is your issue? And the guy says, I have no legs, I have no feet. But I long to know what it's like to have a new pair of shoes. And Smith Wigglesworth started praying for him. And he said, Go pick out a pair of shoes. And the man, 
he prayed and the man manifested legs and, and feet. We have that in us, ladies and gentlemen. How big is your mustard seed? Huh? Hmm. How big is your mustard seed? He said, here, look at my side and look at my hands. Jesus made peace with what had happened to him. He made peace. He said, I made peace with these. Justice was satisfied with these. Peace between you and God and me was established with these. <laughs> How could they deny the physical presence of Jesus? When he was standing there amongst them, and Peter still denied and said, I got to stick my finger in him, you know? Because he denied. He still didn't want to believe it. How could they deny? But yet, here we are, we're living in a world denying and trying to erase Jesus' very existence. We have people denying Jesus left and right. We have churches that are closing their doors left and right. We have pastors who are stepping away from the pulpit and they are saying everything I was teaching you, everything that I was talking to you about was a lie. I will not be one of those. I will tell you about the love of Jesus Christ until my last dying breath. Until they sever my head. And even then, I'm going to stick my tongue out at them. I'm practicing that. I'm not going to go out like a sucker. <laughs> Just kidding. How does peace come in our life? So there are five relations. Wow, that really got, I don't know what happened. So there, there are five relationships where the crucified and risen Christ brings peace into our lives, okay? Number one, peace between us and him. That's the first and most obvious meaning, peace between us and him. He is standing there among them, offering himself as a friend and helper, not a judge. They thought they lost their friend. And here's Jesus standing amongst them, saying, I'm right here. Believe me. Touch me. Hug me. Know that I am here. I'm physical. And I just want to help you help others. <laughs> Do you have someone in your life you can count on to be like that? Do you? I hope you do. I pray to God you have somebody in your life that when you are so depressed and you're so full of anxiety and you're so full of hate and hurt and your habits are overtaking you and you're, you're just down on your knees and you're looking to heaven and you say, God, I need an answer. I pray that somebody comes through that door and will be the hero and the savior of your affliction. I hope you have somebody in your life like that today. I hope so. Thank you, sir. Just leave it right there. I hope it's either a brother, a sister, an uncle, an aunt, a daddy, or a mom. How many praying moms do we have in here? I'm not raising my hand because I'm not a mom. I'm telling you what, the power of a praying mom. 
Moms who pray consistently and continuously for their children and maybe their children's friends or maybe people that they don't even know. Intercessory prayer, I'm telling you what, is powerful. Powerful. If we have the energy of praying moms, we could power the world. And then if you throw in the mix of uh, an occasional praying dad, because I know all of us dads, we're, you know, we're not the best at doing it. We need to. We need to, right? Right? I'm not, I'm not the only dad up here shaking my big head. Right? We need to be better at praying. We need to be better at being intercessory, knowing that, you know, somebody might be hurting, and I need to pray for them. You will often hear me say, if somebody's name comes across your mind, call them, pray for them, or go see them. Because they might be going through something that they need your interaction in. It's either going to be audible, spiritual, or physical. And we need to take an account about that. I'm serious, ladies and gentlemen. I'm serious about that. Number two, peace between us and God. That's why God sent Jesus. <laughs> End of story. Mic drop. No, I'm not, not going to drop. So that's, that's God's justice and wrath. And that's the only way it was going to be satisfied, right? Besides internal punishment, which we can all agree we deserve, right? We all deserve what we're not getting. Did you hear me? We all deserve what we are not getting. God chose not to give it to us. He chose, us, he chose not to do it. Why? Because he sent his son and it was already taken care of on the cross. Huh? Yep. Come on. If this was a football game, y'all would really be excited, but you know. Right? I know you I'm with you on that too. I don't watch any sports. I'm more excited about God than I am about a uh, somebody throwing around some leather ball, you know, pigskin. God makes peace with us by substituting his son's suffering for our penalty. <laughs> I don't know too many people who have a hero gene in them who would be willing to do exactly the same thing that Jesus did, that Jesus went through. You know what I'm saying? I mean, when, when Jonetta was doing her, her live shows and she stuck those things on my head, I was willing to give up every secret I knew. You know, they would have brought out that cat of nine tails and whipped me once. I'd have been, nope, done. I don't think I had it in me, you know. I don't, whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. <laughs> Just don't do that again, right? It hurt. Jesus, though. Jesus has that hero gene in him. Praise God. And he had it in abundance. Had to have. Had to have. You know that old saying, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me? They literally did that with Jesus. They threw sticks and stones at him as he was going up to the hill of Golgotha. Not only were they cursing and, and saying things about him or to him that were vile and nasty, but they literally threw sticks and stones at him. Not only was he whipped and ridiculed, <laughs> but people threw sticks and stones at him. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. It broke my heart. I'll tell you a quick story. One time when we were in Hellfighters and we did a crosswalk and it was the middle of the rally, busy, busy rally. And I was running point man 
for uh, the guy who was carrying the cross. And I had to run up ahead of him and stop the traffic. So that way, you know, he could stop and then start crossing the street. And he stopped right by this biker. And the cross was right there at the guy's feet. And the guy started cursing. He was so angry. He was cursing and spitting and kicking at the cross. Get that away from me. You could hear it in his voice. Get that away from me. It broke my heart. Because I can only imagine that that was just a fraction. Not even a 1%. That was a one millionth of a tatillionth cent of what Jesus had to endure. Get that away from me. The anger and the vile and the spit. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Now he comes to us as a loving father. (laughs) Forgiving us of all our atrocities. Number three, this one's important. Peace between us and others who are in Christ. Write this down. (laughs) To be reconciled to God is to be reconciled to all who are reconciled to God. I feel I need to repeat this. Must be important, right? To be reconciled to God is is to be reconciled to all who are reconciled to God. Your spirit man, you've heard me talk about this before, your spirit man, her spirit man, all right, or woman, to be politically correct, his spirit man, my spirit man, our spirit man, they recognize each other, right? I've talked about this often before when you walk into a room with someone and it feels like you've just known them forever. That's your spirit man connecting with their spirit man. Saying that, you know what, there is something good inside of me that recognizes something good inside of you. Hallelujah. Yes, ma'am, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We should have no hostility vertically or horizontally. We should have no racism. We should have no ethnocentrism or classism or sexism. There should be no division between us. Doesn't matter what you look like. Black. White, yellow, red, green, purple, male, female, squirrel. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There should be no division between God's people. Amen? Weak, strong, fat, skinny, handsome, ugly. I could go on and on. Hungry, starving, rich, poor. All right, enough of that. Galatians 3.28, turn there. Galatians 3.28. Here's, here's, here's the brief and explicit explanation here, okay? There is neither Jew nor Greek, right? There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, I am one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. All right, stop repeating. All right. (laughs) Number four. Peace between us and our souls. It's another important one here. The, two, the New Testament letter to the Hebrews says, Hebrews 9.14 says, 
the blood of Christ will purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Do you need me to repeat that? Yeah? I'm doing it anyway. The blood of Christ will purify our conscience from dead works. That's key right there. Dead works to serve the living God. Hallelujah. Somebody better say amen. Oh, the precious peace of a clear conscience. Anybody want a clear conscience? I want a clear conscience. You know what? Yeah? I'm trying to clear them skeletons out of my closet. <laughs> they be spooky. I love that. How many people labor under uh, misery of a defiled or guilty conscience? Yeah? What does it look like? It looks like anxiety. It looks like depression. It looks like fear. It looks like anger. It looks like mob mentality. <laughs> Come on. Defiled, guilty conscience. You know, if, some, if, if, if I was walking the cross down the aisle and someone got angry at it, maybe it's because they got a defiled, guilty conscience. Maybe it's because what they see in me is bringing out the worst in them because they don't know how to deal with what's going on in them. Because they got a defiled, guilty conscience. Don't blame me for being who I am because you can't handle who you are. Or you don't want to come to an understanding that you need to change. I am who I am because God has designed me, has desired me, has put me in place to be something better than I can be. If you want that, I'll show you how to get it. I'll, 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 I'll show you. I'll, I'll teach you. I'll talk to you. I'll pray with you. But don't blame me for what you're not because of who I am. Amen? Amen? We must forgive ourselves to be free from these shameful thoughts that we are not desirable to God's vision. God loves all of us. Right? I mean, you know, there's times where we just don't feel loved. Why? Because we don't think we're worthy of love. Well, God says you're worthy of love. You're worthy of more than just love. You are perfect in my vision. You might not look like you want to look. But if we're following the obedience in God's word, we're going to look exactly how he desires us to look. Amen? Write this down. Peace with yourself doesn't mean that you start seeing past sins as desirable. Peace with yourself doesn't mean that you start seeing past sins as desirable. We are forgiven. We must forgive ourselves. Often in counseling, me and my wife will tell somebody who is having a hard time finding forgiveness that the first thing you haven't done is forgiven yourself. If you think your wife's going to forgive you, she's probably already forgiven you, but because you're so messed up with your own self-guilt and shame that you haven't forgiven yourself, that you can't hear the forgiveness that is coming out of your spouse or your friend or your family. Amen? Amen? got to forgive yourself. It's narrative to our survival. Write this down. Getting ready to close up here, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Y'all have heard me long enough. Write this down. Peace doesn't mean that past sins cease to be painful. Your past sins will not cease to be painful. They're still going to be there. They're kind of like scars. Any of you had a real bad scar that you can, I mean, it's been like 10 years, but you can still touch it and you could still feel it. 
because it's right on that nerve and you could still feel that pain every time it gets touched or grazed. Peace with ourself. It means that our past sins will no longer be paralyzing. That's paramount. They will no longer be paralyzing. I have never, ever in my life experienced fear to the point to where I was paralyzed. Right? I'll be the first one to tell you, I hear a noise, I'm going the opposite direction. I am not like those people in the movie who run in that direction. Oh, well, let's go check that out. No. Sounds like a chainsaw. Not really interested in it. It's dark outside. It's creepy. I'm going this way. Y'all can come with me or you can go check out the chainsaw. I'll check y'all out. You know, if I don't see you later, I'll see you in heaven. Right? Because <laughs> I ain't doing it. Even with a gun, I would probably be hesitant. You know, it's, it's better to walk away from a fight and live to fight another day than to go and get messed up to where you can't fight at all. <laughs> right on? Our past sins, it means that they cease to demoralize us. When we are forgiven of our past sins, they can no longer hinder us because they have been forgiven. They can't paralyze you. They can't demoralize you. They can't shame you. They should not be able to stop you. Even though they're still there, they're still in the back of your mind. They can't stop you from moving forward. I know the enemy, and he'll, and he'll try to bring those up, right? You know, it's like throwing out the garbage and somebody keeps bringing it in the house. I keep taking it out. Somebody keeps bringing it in. Would you please leave that in the trash can? But no, there's something in there I just got to have. No, there's not. Leave it. All right? I don't want it anymore. My past stinks. <laughs> I was going to say something, but it's really bad. I'm not going to say it. Okay. I can't. <laughs> My wife knows exactly what I was going to say. The pain not be... The pain may not be taken away immediately, but the penalty is taken away immediately through Christ. Amen? And that makes it possible to heal. To heal. And to move on with hope-filled life while you do it. Number five, last one. Last one right here. Peace with the world. When Jesus died, he did what needed to be done. Hallelujah. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. We've read that. So that someday in God's time, all evil will be cast into outer darkness. And the entire new creation will be full of peace and righteousness. Turn your Bibles to Isaiah 9, 7. Isaiah 9, 7. Isaiah 9, 7, it says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. With righteousness from this time forth and forever. Come on, church. Hallelujah. We're going to have peace with Jesus. <laughs> We're going to have peace with God the Father. We're going to have peace with others in Christ. We're going to have peace with ourselves. We're going to have peace with the world. How many of y'all ready for peace? Amen? What Jesus did was an amazing achievement. An amazing achievement. You know, I've read history books, and I've read about some commanders in the military who have brought about peace through conversation. Just through conversation. Now, what Jesus did was an amazing achievement because not only was it through what he was teaching and doing, but it was by the example that he gave on the cross that has brought complete and other peace to our lives. We need to remember that. Amen? And it's not just on Easter. 
It's not just on, you know, Christmas. It is every day we need to remember what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. Amen, right, Dottie? Let us not forget, not even for one day. All right. How do we receive this peace? How do we receive this? Because <laughs> not everybody has it. Not everybody is, is able to receive this gift that God is offering. I don't know why we have the ability to be able to accept the things that God has given us, but some of us reject it. Maybe it's just too good, God. It just sounds too good to be, y'all heard that, right? You know, it sounds too good to be true. It must be false. You know, it just sounds too good to be true. God, I don't know if I could buy into this. You know, it sounds to me like a pyramid scheme. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I don't know. I think it's the kind of pyramid scheme I want to be involved in, right? Because, you know, it goes from the top down. And the more it spreads out, the more people get involved, the more people are loving, the more people who are getting together, the more people I get to rub elbows with. Hallelujah. Fist bump, shake, hug, love. Hallelujah. It's the kind of thing I want to be involved in. <laughs> when we receive it, <laughs> when we receive it, don't walk away from it. Or, or better yet to say, we receive and don't leave, right? We receive and don't leave. If you got it, you got it. Don't give it away unless you're going to teach somebody else how to receive it too. Amen? Jesus is our peace. Y'all agree with that? If you have the risen living Christ as your Savior and Lord and treasure and friend, you have peace that he gives, the peace that he is, and it is an everlasting peace. It will never fade. It will never go away. It won't be ripped. It doesn't need to be sewn. It doesn't need to be boxed up. It doesn't need to be made new. It's everlasting peace when we have Christ in our life. John 1, 12. John 1, 12. To all who receive him, who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Glory, hallelujah. Romans 5, 1. Romans 5, 1, it says, Since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus offers you that. I'm offering that right now on his behalf. It's free. I hope you receive it. I spent this time on the gift of peace because it's found foundational it's foundational if we don't have that type of peace in our life we can't build further up from that we've all got to have peace and then got to do an amazing thing in our lives amen praise god if we don't have peace with god we will take all his other gifts and use them to try to make peace. And it'll fail. It never works. Peace has to be first. And it's free. Everything else is the effect of peace, not the cause. It's the fruit. Peace is the root of Christian faith. Amen? All right. Anybody need prayer today? You want to come up for prayer if you need it? Right now. Let's do it. Bradley, I'll take it anytime. And I'll give it anytime. Father, be with my brother. Continuously he comes forward, Father God, because, you know, he knows he needs more than what he's doing.
Take us from this place today. Surround us with family, with friends. And as I'm going to say this, hug your mama. Do that for me. All right? In Jesus' name we all say, amen. Thank you. Hey, if you don't hear it anywhere else, you're going to hear it right here. God loves you.